What's the biggest risk you've taken? I think so far, probably exiting my successful executive search business, selling my shares, and then building my new career from scratch. How do you feel about it now? Looking back and I was like, oh my God, like this girl is so brave. Is it even me? In your early 20s, you, you have no idea who you are. You have no idea which industry is best for you. What do you think at that point made you brave or make that brave decision? Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader? that your actions matter to those that look up to you. You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening, and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Valentina, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. So good to talk to you. Amazing to have met you at one of the social events. And then thank you so much for sending me some tickets to a podcast event that I went to. And now here we are talking about you and your journey. Very, very curious about all of the pivots that you have made in your career. Thank you so much, Marie. It's a pleasure to be here. Hmm. So I have found out that you were also a headhunter like me in the past, and you have traveled the world. You lived in many countries. You lived in China. You're from Russia, now in London. So made very interesting career moves. So how did you end up in podcasting and why did you end up in podcasting? I indeed was a headhunter and I spent long seven years in that business. It was a boutique executive search company and I was a partner. So I was managing the company. I was setting up our operations uh, and it was amazing and challenging career. Um, and at the same time, I thought after seven years, it's a good time to change. And I always wanted to go to a business school. I've always wanted to do an MBA. So at some point, I decided that it's time and I've chosen to go to Shanghai, to Shanghai Business School for my MBA. It was called China Europe International Business School, SEEPS. And while being at business school, I thought, let's explore. And then my classmates, they suggested me to be a leader of our media and entertainment club at business school and I was a VP of this club and we run many different events. We invited different guests from media industry to talk about new business models, business models related to media, to mobile media, to mobile internet. Uh, and then at some point I realized, oh my God, I love this industry so much. And just a caveat, I am a journalist by trade. So it's my first degree in journalism and I worked as a journalist for a few years early in my career. Almost all my friends are journalists and I keep following the industry. Um, I was fascinated with all the developments and all the challenges the industry is going through. So while at business school, I realized I love the industry and I wanted to go back to the industry. So... I started to network and then at some point I met founders of CastBox 
and I really liked the team. I was very impressed with the founder of the company because she she's actually a woman, same age as me. I didn't know that. Yeah, she's amazing. Uh, wow. uh, her name is Renee, Renee Wang. She's a famous entrepreneur. Prior to CastBox, she worked at Google in Japan. And then she started CastBox on her own. And then gradually she raised funds. She hired the team. Um, so CastBox became a VC-backed company. Um, and then, yeah, at some point when they were raising um, another round and they were launching different new features when they were building the app, they were looking at international growth, you know. And then I met them at that point and I was impressed with the company, with people, with the business model and with the entire world of podcasting. And we found out that we went to the same business school. Rene was at the same business school in entrepreneurial program. And then we connected through that. I suggested them that I can help them in business development in Europe because that's my experience. I have been doing business development for my previous business for that executive search company. And they were very open to that. And yeah, this is how we started working together and gradually uh, within CastBox, I was in different roles. I was helping the team to build a product, to launch the new features. And at some point I switched to a business development role. And uh, now I'm in charge of global partnerships within the industry. Mm. So you effectively created your own role. That's true. That's amazing. I think that's one of the things that, you know, as a headhunter myself, when you look and talking to candidates and they ask me, oh, can you help me find something else? And I'm like, well, so that's not necessarily what I do. But I'm thinking, well, you can also think about what you want to do and approach people that you like, who you're impressed with in the industry and say, I can do X, Y and Z and basically present your own business case to to go and do it so that's impressive that's that true. you've done that yeah that's true that's very true at some point you know especially if your career is not linear um sometimes it's yeah the roles they don't exist you won't be able to go on a website and find a vacancy that would suit you but instead you can see you know your skills you know your uh, which value you can add to the company and then you can present yourself mm. as, yeah, exactly. You can put together a business case mm. of yourself as a professional. Going back to your earlier career. So you're talking about, you know, coming from kind of PR and journalism and then going into recruitment and then doing business development and then effectively like, you know, creating your own role within an industry that you felt passionate about. Have you always been aware of your skills, like what you do well, or is it something that's just sort of come with time for you? Um, well, obviously, when in your early 20s, you, you have no idea who you are, you have no idea which industry is best for you. And actually, this is, was this was the moment how I switched to executive search. Mm -hmm. So I was in journalism and I knew that I can interview people, that I can do some analytical work. I'm good at research. And also because I was also experienced in communications, I was in PR agency helping with events. And then I thought, I'm good with people. I enjoy being on public. I enjoy public speaking. I enjoy meeting clients and I enjoy having different projects from time to time. And then when I started this executive search journey, um, it was not that I thought I am a great fit. I was like in my early 20s, I was like, mm, this sounds interesting. And this doesn't require any additional training because I've got the skills and I don't need, you know, to know finance. I don't need to know accounting. It was not necessarily very rational, but, you know, starting talking to people, I kind of realized that I can try there and potentially I know that I may, it may be a success. Mm. What appealed to you going into that industry? While I was in media, I was really interested in how media companies earn their money, how they structure their business processes, because I, it was always a question, you know, um, for, for any media company, how to be profitable. And then already I've seen so many media companies that were 
that failed that had to shut down and uh, lay off people and i was like mm, like why some of the companies are successful and some are not and then i started to do my research i started to um, be interested in how management of media companies work and how the boards of directors work and what's the role of the ceo what these people do and then i realized media business is a business uh, and back then, yeah, I was already very interested in this aspect, how the these businesses are managed. And then when I met Executive Search um, team, I realized that what this business is doing is basically looking for managers to manage the companies. Like they go on a market, they try to find the best professionals to fit the roles. And then also they search for independent directors and like they bring all these people on board to help businesses grow. And then I was like, oh, that's that, that's the match. Like that's um, that's what I want to know more about. Definitely. If I go to executive search, I can learn about this magical world of business, of how companies are managed and what uh, makes them successful hmm. and did you feel like this is this is so interesting because for me when I got into executive search I was how old was I, I was 22 or something Same like that so just me. out of university yeah. was like I don't know what I'm doing I went to a graduate fair and there was this man who I thought was recruiting people into marketing and sales. I was like, yeah, I want to be independent. I want to make money. Like, let's see what this sort of sells and marketing. But it ended up selling me on the recruitment and saying, oh, you know, this is what it's like. You get to talk to really senior people, etc." And I was like, oh, this sounds really cool. So anyway, so he was the one, who, he was a headhunter for the headhunting industry. Mm -hmm. So he ended up placing me in my first role. And yeah, so the motivation was make money and then learn about, you know, how the world works at the very top in terms of, you know, what the, all of the decisions that get made at the top. But you didn't have much of an idea. I had zero idea. I mean, nobody, nobody, it wasn't like I woke up when I was six years old. I'm like, I want to be a headhunter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's not how it works. You just sort of fall into it. But there is this, it was a very interesting part about really understanding the mechanics of a business and how that is run from a people perspective. But what I'm really curious because you kind of you you we, we were an outsider then you went to recruitment then you came out of that and I think a lot of people don't understand what hunters actually do but what was the misconception that you had about going to become a headhunter and what did you learn from that experience I didn't have any expectations like mm. I had zero expectations when I started working in executive search and what really attracted me was one thing when you go to talk to your client and you have a meeting with the founder of a company and the, the this founder guy is telling you I'm gonna replace my CEO can you help me with that and at, at that point, I was like, oh, my God, I'm getting access to really sensitive information. And this never happened to me when I was in journalism, you know, because as a journalist, you have to you have so many layers before you can get access to like really valuable stuff because, you know, companies don't want to share with journalists and like they share just tiny bits that make them look good that's it so yeah when i um and when i started you know to talk to clients and executive search i was like oh my god i really can see um what's important for them and like how they make money and like which choices they have to make what kind of moral aspects are behind everything yeah, so that was really, really attractive. It was like a drug, you know, access to this valuable, rare, uh, very, very sensitive information. Mm. You have to build up so much trust with someone to be able to allow themselves to reveal that information. And I guess to some extent, like being a journalist, 
and being a headhunter is like the polar opposite because one is to spread the word and the other one is to keep the secrets and, you know, help the business at that stage to be able to overcome whatever the challenges they've got through people. Yeah, but for journalists, I guess, if you're a really good journalist, uh, it's the same thing. You have to build trust. Uh, you have to, you know persuade people to open up and you know you have all your different tools for some of people it would be you know public interest for some of them it will be like access to large audiences so it's 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 hard to be a good journalist mm, it's true i never really thought about it that way because you know, on the one hand, you're trying to get the information, but if you betray someone's trust, then they're not going to open up to you again, or that's the reputation that you will uphold, you know, going forward. Some of the thread that I see in your experience is, you know, you were interested in the mechanics of how businesses run. You know, that's the attraction for you for, for going into headhunting to go into an MBA, again, learning about businesses. Where does that come from for you? It's probably like a cultural thing growing up in post-Soviet environment. Um, and everyone was kind of obsessed of doing business at that time. And I think it influenced me a lot because um, as a kid, you can see I was able to see, you know, so many people around me who are trying to be entrepreneurs and they, a lot of them failed. A lot of them were not able to, you know, continue their entrepreneurial career. And even my parents, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were trying to start their own business, but it was not successful. And, you know, like this, for me, I probably it felt like a gamble. At some point, you know, because I was like, <laughs> but like other people are successful, you know, other people are able to make this work. Mm. So, yeah, I never f thought about that, actually. But now you're asking, I'm thinking it's probably like, um, yeah, from the childhood. Mm. Do you remember the differences of what the, your life was before <laughs> to after? I was born in Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. I was very mm -hmm. uh, little girl when everything happened. But yeah, I remember that turbulence because obviously after like one country ceased to exist and then like the new country is starting, then there is a lot of turbulence around, you know, and also it's um, also what was the most challenging is transition from planned economy to the market economy. And I think people were completely lost mm. because nobody, there were no business schools in Soviet Union and there were no opportunities for people to travel abroad and to even to see how mm, developed economies work, how it feels to live in a market economy. Um, yeah. So, I think there was a lot of turbulence and a lot of a lot of pain mm -hmm. connected to that. Mm. Do you think this is why you're now or in your experience in your career that you wanted to live in different countries? When I decided to move to China for my MBA, it mm -hmm. was not because um not because I wanted to to be in China. I just wanted to have international experience. And every single move is a different, you know, it is a different decision, different sets of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So at that time, um, I wanted to live in a different culture. I wanted to live somewhere where the culture will be just a very new experience, very different experience to me. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, as like I somehow felt it would help me, it would help to shape my personality. Mm. Hmm. Going back to what you were saying about growing up in one country and then all of a sudden it's something else. I remember really clearly, I grew up with my grandmother and every day you go to school and you have the books with 
Lenin carrying the, you know, that log story. And it's in every single book that you have, it's a story that's just continuously like repeated back to you. And it was so part of my psyche that that, that was the truth. This is how, you know, things are. And almost like revering as a, as a deity. And then from one, it's literally, it was like from one day to the next, this is all not true. We're living in a different world now. And all of a sudden you have to accept a completely different reality. And I'm talking about as a, you know, like a, how old was I? I was like nine years old when I remembered that thinking like that. And I was like, so strange that you just don't, that you can go from believing one thing and then the next day it's something else. And I think for me, it was the time when I was thinking, you can actually question things about what you first believe to be true to then not. So I don't know. I think it left definitely an imprint for me in terms of, um, yeah, that you don't necessarily have to believe everything that you hear and you need to find this out for yourself. I don't remember Lenin uh, pictures in the books. Mm -hmm. It was very funny, actually. I never learned anything about communism, but it was very funny when I moved to China. And then I all of a sudden figured out that my business school classmates who went to Chinese uh, preschools, they had this and they, mm. you know, in, in their uh, books and they knew better the mm. life of Lenin and the history of Lenin. They knew it much better than me. How did you end up in London? Castbox has its uh, biggest audience in the US and then the second biggest audience here in the UK. So when I was thinking of moving to a new country because I left China during COVID. It was hard at some point, you know, with all the lockdowns. So I left and then I was choosing where to move next. And then last year with all this uh, geopolitical events, I had to make a decision. And London is a good choice, obviously, because podcasting is very developed here. And in my current role, I work with this market a lot. So it was a good compromise. Going back to you know, your podcasting life now <laughs> in terms of, you know, you get to see a lot of podcasts, you get to work with the creative teams. Like, what do you find makes an excellent podcast for you? First of all, it has to be a story. Either it's a conversational podcast and you're bringing different guests to your show with every episode. It's great when they can tell stories. If it's a documentary narrative type of podcast, it's great when there is a story behind it. Um, and stories, what normally attracts audience, you know, audience love uh, to, to hear about someone else's experiences and ups and downs and all the hardship or all the happiness along the way. So yeah, I think that's like the main, mm. the main part. And, but obviously, you know, when we start looking into podcasting as a business, there are many, many layers to it. It has to be absolutely great in production. I mean, if you're just a beginner, if you're just starting your journey in podcasting, you can start with a very very limited equipment you can start with very basic equipment and it's it's okay it's fine but when you're thinking of it as a product it's good um, to think of improved quality maybe think about sound design at some point it's like story part and then the technical part mm. it should be like foundational and when you say sound design what do you mean in terms of your kind of like your jingle how you use music throughout the podcast is that what you're talking about exactly so mm. podcasting is a very special medium uh, podcasts talk to us uh, by the sound so it talks to your ears and you cannot have any visual aspect there is no visual aspect normally you know people normally listen consume this type of content with their ears so you don't have any additional 
measures to you don't have colors you don't have um faces yeah no faces mm -hmm. no facial expressions you have to be able to transmit everything via the sound so that's why you know the sound has to be rich ideally the sound has to be expressive and again ideally you want to have expressive people talking on the podcast you want to have speaking about sound design it's good because music is can be expressive you know sounds can be expressive if you record some ambient sounds they can definitely um, add colors you know to your sound picture what about this trend now of wanting to have more of a visual aspect? I mean, I made a choice to go and be on YouTube from the start. So the visual aspect for me was, you know, quite key. Do you think that it is more important now to have the visual aspect as well? Or do you think they're completely two different styles? I would say it's good to have a visual aspect if you can afford it because for many people why they go into podcasting means they want to spend less on production because this is much easier uh, type of content to produce at the same time youtube is requires a lot of a lot more attention a lot more equipment a lot more editing um, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I don't have to tell you about mm -hmm. that. Like you, you have been in this for, for a lo very long time and what's going on now on the market. A lot of people who, uh, establish themselves, themselves as podcast hosts in audio, they start, you know, to explore what kind of audience they can reach on YouTube because, uh, audience on YouTube is totally different world. It's a different platform with, you know, very different users, uh, very different patterns. They love different content. They consume um, with their eyes oftentimes. So I guess what's going on now, people are trying to grow their audiences because in audio world, for some big creators, the... Uh, I, I'm not going to say they're not growing anymore. They are still growing because there are so many first-time users on all the platforms, on Apple, on Spotify, on CastBox. There are so many first-time users are coming into the space. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's just so much opportunities on YouTube because it has billions of audience and it just makes sense. If you can afford it, it's good to work with this audience. And also you have different algorithms. There are lots of opportunities for monetization. Uh, so yeah, I totally see the trend. And, you know, when I talk to creators, they say they are happy when they try YouTube, they are happy with the result. And the audience on YouTube, it is different type of audience and uh, this audience does not cannibalize the existing you know audience in audio so that is good what advice would you give me <laughs> or a podcast host that has conversational podcasts to keep the audience watching listening for longer that is challenging um i would say the main challenge to be very honest is not to make people to listen longer to the show the main challenge is to make them come back for the next episode and what makes them come back is when you match their expectations because they have some expectations they listen to one or two episodes and then they expect you to bring more founders and or people who can talk about career pivots and then once you match their expectations um yeah they stay normally and they follow you along your journey and like they uh the most dedicated audience they just so grateful and very sticky so i'm asking the wrong question <laughs> in terms of it's not about how long they can stay for an individual episode it's to get them to come back i think so yeah talking about monetization this is something you touched on earlier what are the different ways of monetizing a podcast? Mm, the new way that is, it's not like really new, uh, the programmatic ads is not new, but it 
it has seen a lot of growth in past couple of years because um, I'm, I'm talking about this programmatic ads because there was no tech in place and now there is tech to do it in a very efficient way. And what we love about podcasts is that you can monetize your back catalog. You cannot re-record your old episodes, uh, but with this type of tech, you can insert ads in your episodes that you recorded a year ago or two years ago. So I think this type of ads, this type of monetization has changed the industry a bit. You know, it helped so many podcasters to monetize their back catalog. And, you know, there are so many people who have evergreen content. It's like content that uh, is never old. You know, you can listen to it at any time and it, it can still be very valuable to the audience. So I think... Oftentimes, um, people just don't pay enough attention um, to this programmatic type of monetization. But obviously, you know, there are so many other types of monetization. And it's important, if you're a podcaster, it's important to find your mm, one way to monetize or like a proper mix for yourself we have this baked in ads when you you know when you introduce a product or a service during the show and historically uh, the the most relevant brands uh, are so-called direct to consumer brands the brands that don't go to retail but then they sell online so this has been you know our bread and butter in the industry um it's still in place. It's still working. Um, brands are very receptive. And thanks God, like in past probably five years, I know the um, marketing budgets are going into podcasting because people who work in marketing, they started to be familiar with this medium and they're much more receptive to it. So yes, this part, this type of ad still exists. What, what else I think... It's good to look at other ways of monetization. I think if you are making a podcast about a uh, social cause, you can think about asking your audience to support you on Patreon or on other platforms so they can donate. It will be like direct support with no ads involved. And this is, a again, this is a working way to earn money from people directly because if there is a social cause related to your show, to your investigation, probably people are much more receptive to support you. But um, obviously there are so many other ways, not probably not direct ways to monetize your show. Um, there are events, you can do public recordings of the podcast and the tickets, sell tickets to it. You can write a book based on your podcast. And this is what so many podcasters are doing. And this is, again, working way to, to earn money, to monetize. What is great about podcasting? We are living in the era where the infrastructure is in place. So there are hosting platforms, there are ad insertion tools, um, there are so many different, again, support platforms for recording, for editing, for community building. So the infrastructure is in place. So it's a, it's a great moment. Um, it's a new, relatively new medium and it's a growing medium. Mm, it's very aligned to the way how people live. You know, it's very aligned to the ideas of like being efficient, but at the same time, you know, um, getting some entertainment for yourself. So it's great times for podcasting, but at the same time, um, if you're a creator, if you're a podcaster, and if you're trying to make business out of it, there is n not necessarily just one way to monetize. It can be a mix mm -hmm. of several different ways. Mm. Talking about sponsors... Asking for a friend, <laughs> what do sponsors look for in sponsoring a podcast? I think they are looking at your audience. They want direct access because, you know, again, what we love about podcasting, it's a very intimate medium. And if people consume it through the earbuds, it's 
someone talking directly to your ears. So normally you build a connection with your audience and listeners, they think of a host as of, you know, a sister or a brother or a friend. So the level of trust is enormous. So that's why, you know, when you are talking to a potential sponsor to your show, you can sell this very unique direct access to your audience. The thing that every sponsor, every company, every business is looking uh, is to, you know, the audience that is a good match to their product or their service. Any tips on how to get more of an idea of what your audience is? It's quite hard to see who your audience is. I mean, on YouTube, you can sometimes see who subscribes to you, but you can't necessarily see who they are. I mean, me being a headhunter and knowing how to research and kind of like dig deep and finding people, I can probably find out sometimes, you know, kind of like stalk them online, but I can't do that for every individual. So any tips on how you can really understand who your audience is? I would say if you are advanced podcaster, it's probably good to run a survey and ask people and you would be surprised how responsive they are. A lot of people are just willing to share and, you know, give you feedback. And again, because it's such an intimate medium, it's good to talk to your audience. And normally it's it works if you are reaching out to your audience, they are normally very responsive. Mm. And then from this, you can have a better idea. Mm. But also if you are just a podcaster distributing to the platforms. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot, with all this GDPR and data protection regulation, you cannot get so many details, not necessarily. So the way how to surpass that normally is to create your community around like other platforms, probably establish a Facebook group or have your Instagram account and support it and nurture it or as as for your your case you have an amazing community on linkedin and you can see the data from there mm -hmm. um what else i think also uh, again in podcasting what really works it's newsletter the difference between um talking to your audience through a podcast and talking to your audience through a newsletter is that you know if you want to deliver a message uh, you have to wait until you drop your next episode. And this may not happen like until next month. Mm -hmm. But then if you're having your newsletter and if you want to deliver a certain message, you can just send it to them sooner if you want. And then this will be direct access to, to a person. And again, if you have your newsletter a database, you can reach out to people and ask them for the feedback but also more information you can and more feedback from your audience you can get on platforms um, oftentimes people just you know distribute across the platforms and oftentimes they don't know that there is a opportunity to leave comments mm -hmm. and um, some of the podcasters when they go to the platforms and when they see the comments they were like oh i had no idea the you know that they're even there. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. people are there, they're writing what they like, what they dislike, who they are, what they expect, what they like wish to hear in the next episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just uh, go and search across the platforms. There may be already information there. Because I've recently discovered that on Spotify, you can run polls, so you can ask things. And that was like a completely brand new thing. What do you do on CastBox that we should be aware of? So on CastBox, there is also an option to mm -hmm. leave comments and a lot of people, right. especially, you know, if it's an old podcast, a long time running podcast, there is normally a huge community around it and audience go to comments and then they leave feedback and they talk again. You would be surprised. They say, oh my God, this investigation, is it didn't go the way I expected. Mm -hmm. And like they normally you know, they, they may, you know, respond to each other. Um, 
Yeah, and for a creator, it can be a source of information. Mm. Because you have to be a bit of an investigator yourself because there's so many different platforms that you've got your podcast on. And then plus, if you have YouTube, okay, you can see the comments. And then plus all of your other distribution platforms, like, you know, like you said, Instagram or TikTok or Facebook, and just like pulling it all together is a lot of a lot of work. I feel like it's it's a job in itself to be able to do that. Kudos to all the individual independent podcasters. Yes. Well, on that note, I mean, one of the hardest things, especially early days, when you are sometimes feeling like no one's really listening or your listenership is so small that you think, what am I doing this for? Like, what would you say to those early podcasters to kind of keep them going, to give them hope? I think that's the hardest part, uh, going from zero to one. We, in, in this industry, we normally know that this is the hardest part. And if you're able to do this, it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be all right. You start with your circle, you start with your friends, and then you try to, you know, find the audience that might be interested in your topic and, I think any collaboration with similar podcast with similar topic would definitely help in podcasting. The, the biggest challenge probably is to encourage someone who is not exposed to this medium. You know, there are so many people who consume information through articles, through videos and it's hard to make them consume information via audio. So when you are starting and if you want to make very intentional effort to grow your podcast, it's good to find the audience who is already responsive to the medium, who is already familiar with the apps, who have their listening patterns. So normally when you collaborate with other podcasters, who already have the audience and you find mutual value that you can add to each other, and then it will be already a good start. What's your view on paying attention to how many downloads you have per episode? Mm, I would say it's important for sponsors because at the end of the day, everyone wants the audience. And when you're talking to a potential sponsor, it's great to show them some numbers. I've had hundreds of meetings with companies alongside the creators when we were trying to give them a better idea how the stats works because everyone is looking at how big is the volume, how big is the audience that you are reaching. It can be great content, but... Unfortunately, you no. Know, when people are making decisions on their marketing budgets and how they're going to spend their marketing budgets, they need even, you know, to, to get an approval. They need to understand the potential return on investment. At the end of the day, it's all about business. It's all about the companies deciding on their marketing budgets. Um, yeah, unfortunately, they need numbers. So let's talk numbers. What's, uh, what's to break it down into categories, what's good, better, best? It's hard to generalize because every podcast is different. And if you, again, if you are a podcast with just a couple thousand downloads per episode, this may be good enough if you're reaching very niche audience and companies would buy it. But if we're talking about large podcasters, general interest podcasts, entertaining podcasts, we should be talking about 10, 20,000 downloads per episode. But it's not, it's not uh, you know, it's not the silver bullet. So I don't think every single podcaster has to aim at this high. What about frequency? It's good to be consistent. It's good to stick to the frequency. If you're doing twice a month, 
stick to this frequency because again what's important to your audience is to meet their expectations and if they know that you drop your episode every second tuesday they expect you to do the same i mean that word consistency just keeps cropping up in everything and it's the hardest thing in the world it's like staying consistent going to the gym staying consistent on your social media content staying consistent on the podcast but i certainly see that if we have a break then that makes a big impact because like you build up the momentum and then if you stop then it's, again, it's almost like you're not necessarily starting from the beginning, but it takes a little bit of time to build that up again. I have been working for a platform for so many years and I can give you a perspective of a platform. Mm -hmm. If you are having a really long break in between your seasons, their attention is not going to last they just change their preferences, they switch to another type of content. Especially if you tell them that you are coming back and you are not coming back on time, or if you didn't notify them about a break, you know, so normally it's uh, just a rule of thumb. You notify them that you are going to be on a break, that like your season one is over, and then like you're coming back for the next season. So you set up the expectations and then... Stick to it. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You do what you say you're going to do. Mm. Is podcasting what you Mm. expected it to be? I really love the industry. Mm. I really love the industry. And I don't think... um, I I want to be in this industry. I got elected uh, as a board member for the Podcast Academy, which is the largest professional organization in podcasting. And... I'm privileged to be a board member and to oversee the development and growth. Um, So through this, I connected to so many people. And I think that through this work together with the team, with other board members, with other academy members, um, we are helping to grow the industry a lot. And this is fascinating because it's a new industry and I feel I'm privileged to be within this industry at this stage. Mm. And I think my, I, I personally can see that my contribution, my support and like our work together can help this industry to professionalize, to grow, to expand, to be more inclusive And at the end of the day, you know, help those podcasters who Mm. love this craft and they want to make a living out of it. Mm. What's the future of podcasting? There is a huge potential. There are so many people who are not exposed to the medium, especially outside the US. There are so many people who never tried that. So I can see there is a huge potential. And with all the technologies, because technologies, they keep developing, you know, the companies, they release new phones, they release new earbuds. The industry will definitely keep growing and hopefully the brands will keep supporting, will keep spending with the industry. There were some challenging moments in past several months with, uh, you know, layoffs happening in some podcasting companies, but the industry keeps growing and the professionalization is going on there so Mm -hmm. yeah i think it's very exciting Mm -hmm. what podcast do you listen to (laughs) what's the genre that you like that's a great question Mm -hmm. i do listen to so many different types of podcasts Mm -hmm. being in this role working for Castbox, and i'm in charge of partnerships with the creators so i talk to the creators i have to understand their craft i have to know the stories i have to know the investigation they made a lot of them won some awards i have to be aware of what they're doing i have to understand the product in detail but personally i think as a human being i always have my own preferences you know i am uh, i can tell you right away i'm not a big fan of true crime okay i was gonna say is it yeah. serial killers that you know get to sleep at night no 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 no, 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 really. yeah. no if you ask me as a young woman i'm interested in everything uh relationship all sorts of relationship podcasts uh you know dating Mm, yeah 
this this category is really big for me. Yeah. Um, the other category is still business. Everything about scaling the companies. I really love content about. I really love entrepreneurial stories, you know, Mm -hmm. people who started their own business. And uh, I think this is probably the category that I'm most fascinated about, you know, how people start their businesses and how they manage to grow the companies. Yeah, I really love this content, not only in podcasting, but also in theater, uh, in films. Like, What's your favorite film? Mm, business related any <laughs> let me talk about one i just mm-hmm. uh, like it has uh, been my favorite film for a long time it's schindler's list mm-hmm. and i recently rewatched it and i realized that there is a humongous business aspect there in this story because schindler himself he was just entrepreneur and he was a business person and the way he started to hire Jewish people because he wanted to cut his costs and then it was like very rational decision so he hired so many Jewish people for his factory and this is just this just blows my mind you know and then at some point the real life clashes with this business ideas with this business perspective and the way how he was able to navigating the situation Mm. that's that's amazing and at the end of the day you know he he was still a successful entrepreneur but he also made this contribution to the society you know Mm. for yeah this this is amazing story Mm. did you feel like you identified with him as a character or who, who or alternatively any other characters that you have identified with in the story i i think his character is just uh, yeah. just outstanding if i am in front of these choices as business person mm-hmm. i i really hope i would do the same mm. i think it was alain de baton who is the founder of the school of life i think it was from one of his videos where he talks about the kind of movies and the kind of entertainment that we like to watch and consume is a reflection and an indication of what our preferences are and the problems that we're trying to solve. So it's so interesting how early on we're talking about you really wanting to understand the kind of like the inner workings of a business, going to business school, and then talking about like one of your favorite films, like like they all tie in together. So this entrepreneurial streak is something that is very consistent Mm. in what you like so like. yeah absolutely i mm. love the very attractive part is gambling because there is a kind of gambling aspect mm. you know you have to have your if you're an entrepreneur you have mm. to have your big vision and you never know if it's going to work mm. or not and then you just make people to believe in what you believe and mm. it's like it's a lot of kind of game, not gambling necessarily, mm. but there's a game aspect and it's like... It's risk. It's risk. Mm. Yeah. R- risk is very attractive uh, in all the stories. What's the biggest risk you've taken? I think so far, probably exiting my successful executive search business, selling my shares and then without having any idea of what I'm going to be doing, moving to China, going to a business school in China in a very completely in a different market. Uh, I left all my contacts, all my connections behind because all of them were centered around post-Soviet Union countries. Um, and then just building my new career from scratch. I think that was very, like looking back, um, I think, think it was very adventurous Mm. how do you feel about it now the decisions that you made um i don't know like i'm looking back and i was like oh my god like this girl is so brave is it even me you know sometimes i'm just looking back and like um yeah i cannot you know, some sometimes I'm just like, no, it's, it it can't be me. Mm-hmm. It's just you know, it's someone else. I'm not that brave. I'm not that adventurous. You know, to go through these challenges, to change my life, to have all these pivots. But yeah, that's me. 
that's 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 me that's you know who i am and some sometimes it's just hard to believe what do you think at that point made you brave or make that brave decision did you even see it as being brave at that point yes and no again like growing older becoming more mature you kind of becoming more rational you know when we are younger we tend to be more impulsive and you know yeah without going through all these hardships you not necessarily you think of how this would turn out because you know going to to a business school it's like it's a challenge by itself and you never expect it to be that because you think okay maybe like at some point i start working and then i have some income but the reality is like once you are enrolled in an mba program you are busy full time it's like it's hard work and your day ends at 1 or 2 a.m and then next day you wake up at 7 you go to class and then it's like it's so packed um so i guess um oftentimes it's not just uh be, be, before going to a business school obviously i talked to like a ton of people who uh had similar experiences and then they kind of they told me that it, it it's not going to be easy but i was like okay i can do i can do this i'm strong like i'm experienced i had my business but yeah once you actually dive into it uh, once you just start um studying your mba then you just oh my god like this is yeah this is harder than i thought mm. so my point is that oftentimes we just uh w without having expectations um yeah when we don't have any expectations it's just it what makes us brave <laughs> Well, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So right. you have to take that leap of faith mm -hmm. and believe that whatever the outcome, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, amazing for you to, to have done that. And Thank to you. So many interesting experiences and um, loved talking to you. Thank you so much, Valentina, for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Maria. Yeah. It was an amazing experience. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What were your takeaways? And if you haven't already, I'd love for you to subscribe and follow this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.